who's ever seen, maybe volunteering, or at least you've seen pictures, or not, you see a picture now of a patient like this, right? This patient, uh, patient's eye is going to be really difficult to examine. Everybody agree with that? But we want to know, right? Because it looks like they had trauma right in this region. So it's kind of important to evaluate what's going on with their globe and their eyeball. So we'd like to get some information about that, but it's going to be very hard to examine. So I want to show you just this one cool thing you can do, and I think it's as cool as it is useful, is you can check the pupillary reflex even when you can't see their pupil, right? So you take the right angle with your probe, you shine it down so that you can get the pupil in view, then you shine a light in the non-affected eye to see the consensual response. So you can determine a couple things. The pupil's round and it's reactive. So that suggests at least some pretty basic ocular functions are intact. So that's some pretty useful information you can gain. Now the caution is they have a lot of trauma to their eye, globe rupture has got to be on your list, so do this with caution or at least at your stage now, do it with supervision of someone who's willing to take a little bit of the risk of suspected globe rupture and, and that kind of thing. But that can be helpful and it's also, I don't know, an entertaining feature that you can do. The next kind of anterior thing that we'll look at, this doesn't happen that often, but it can happen sometimes after trauma or uh, spontaneously in patients with connective tissue disease is lens dislocation. So essentially you take an image of their eyeball and you notice the lens is no longer here, it's somewhere else where it doesn't belong. And this is a pretty straightforward, easy diagnosis to make with ultrasound and may or may not be as easy to make without ultrasound. So everybody see that big thing that doesn't belong where it is? Pretty obvious, right? So that's really the anterior things that you can see with ultrasound are not as numerous. And a lot of those things you can see by a physical exam. The things in the vitreous chamber are the things that are more difficult to diagnose by exam, especially without being able to, to if you're not able to dilate their eye or if it's going to take a while and you want your diagnosis quicker than that, or if you don't even have the right equipment. I work in some emergency departments that don't even have a slit lamp to help us do uh, a thorough exam. So ultrasound can be really helpful in these situations. So a lot of the problems that occur in the vitreous chamber are usually kind of sudden painless vision changes or loss of vision. And those patients will show up in clinics or the emergency departments and we want to know what's going on with them pretty quickly and ultrasound can help us out. So one of the big things that's always on our list, one of the top things on our differential when we sit here, sudden painless vision loss is retinal detachment. And if they're maybe an older person on medications and they've got really constricted pupils, it can be really hard to see before you dilate them what's going on. Or you can stick the ultrasound probe and in about 20 seconds you have a diagnosis of retinal detachment. So that's what this is. That, you know, normally everything back here should just be black fluid. You shouldn't see any bright white stuff floating around in here. This is the thick, heavy sheet of the retina that's peeled off and detached from the connective tissue. And you can see here it's kind of tethered towards the nerve. And I think I have some details about the retina because there are things that can look similar that you need to differentiate. So it's a thick layer of tissue. It's heavy, so it often tends to kind of lay in a dependent area. It's very bright, and it's a single sheet. It may have folds in it, but it doesn't have branches. And then if you follow it, it'll usually tether at the nerve. So those are going to be important characteristics to differentiate retinal detachment from other things. But this is a diagnosis you can easily make. It's rapid. You can find it with ultrasound probably more quickly than you can find it by physical exam or other means. Some other posterior problems are foreign bodies. Now this is again probably if you thought this was really here maybe you shouldn't have stuck the probe on there because this could this is gonna penetrate the globe and be a ruptured globe but somebody did I didn't do this one but I stole this picture from I don't know somewhere on the internet probably and uh, you can see this actually I think it's from a textbook this ocular foreign body and like kidney stones and other things, you put color on them, they get this little twinkle artifact, which is just interesting. But those are easy to find. Maybe you shouldn't have found it, but they're cool to look at. And then the other super common thing that causes painless vision loss, as opposed to the foreign body, which is probably painful vision loss, is posterior vitreous detachment. And we see this, this is probably the most common cause of floaters and painless vision changes that we see. And you can see what this looks like. It's not as obvious usually as retinal detachment. 
but to the untrained eye, this could look very similar, right? You see this white stuff floating around as they move. It floats around in the back of their eyeball. It looks kind of like sheets, but some, there are some significant differences between this and retinal detachment. It's not nearly as bright, thick, or heavy. It doesn't look like it's a single sheet. You kind of see little branches and little fuzzy things going off in different directions. And it doesn't tether itself to the nerve. And if, you, if you're paying really close attention, you see how bright everything is around it? So a lot of times to see these well, you have to really crank up the gain, which you shouldn't have to do with the retinal detachment because the retina is very bright. And then the other thing that can look very similar as well is vitreous hemorrhage. So vitreous hemorrhage and vitreous attachment sometimes can be indistinguishable, and only by a physical exam are you going to tell the difference. So again, floaty stuff, but you don't see a single bright, heavy sheet. Here you see, this is probably all hemorrhage. This is probably just some of that blood that's really started to coagulate and get dense, although this would be very difficult to differentiate from a retinal detachment. And remember, when the retina detaches, it's going to bleed a little bit. So if you see blood in the back of the eye on ultrasound, be very vigilant to make sure it's not associated with a, it's not just a secondary finding to a retinal detachment. But here's what some of the blood, this looks more like what we expect blood to look like, but depending on the phase of coagulation, it's going to look a little different. And, but this is usually, again, spontaneous, uh, but it may accompany other uh, retinal or vitreous detachments. So you have to, just because you see blood, you can't stop searching for the other pathology that might exist in the back of their eye. And I just like to break these down, because again, they can look very similar. So retina versus vitreous, retina is thick, heavy, bright, single sheet tethered at the nerve. And the vitreous attachment, thin, branches, not as well defined, and it's not really tethered anywhere. You usually have to turn the gain up a little higher to see it well. And just visual examples, so big, thick retina, and less distinct branching vitreous detachment. And you see how bright everything is around because we've turned up the gain a lot to see this well. Those look pretty clear. You think you could differentiate those? Most heads say yes, others are like, this all looks the same to me, I have no idea. And then a few other things that sometimes you're going to encounter if you're looking. Uh, most of the time these are more specific uh, ophthalmology office diagnoses, but you may see other things like masses, tumors, you can have metastasis to the eye, so you may see things like this. And they, these may cause bleeding or associated retinal or vitreous detachments as well. Not as much in the general medical population, but more in the opto clinic. Questions on some of that posterior or vitreous chamber stuff? So it should be just a big black ball back there. Anything that's not a black ball back there is something wrong, either hemorrhage or ret retinal or vitreous detachment. And that's what makes it kind of easy because any deviation from that we can recognize. All right, let's talk a little bit about the optic nerve, just moving our way back. Sometimes if I'm trying to impress patients when I'm doing a fundoscopic exam, I tell, especially little kids, I say, I'm looking into the back of your brain, right? Because your optic nerve is really just an extension of the, the central nervous system and even is communicating with the subarachnoid space. And that's kind of the, the, only, the real important fact that I want you to understand with the optic nerve and its connection with the subarachnoid space. So when you have cerebral edema, Sometimes we can look in the back of the eye with the fundoscopic exam and see papal edema associated with that, or we can recognize that with ultrasound as well. So this is our cartoon view of the fundoscopic exam. You guys practice this yet? Some? I think you practice it more next year as well. So, you know, when you look back here, you see the optic disc and the optic nerve. It should have a nice crisp border. Here's a real-world picture, so you see all the vessels coalesce kind of centrally. You see nice, well-defined disc margins, although sometimes this view is a little difficult to obtain. Practice makes you better at it, but sometimes you can't get a great view. And then as papal edema progresses, you lose those borders, right? So here the borders are kind of smudged as it's kind of pushing its way up. And here we have really severe papal edema where you can almost not even recognize the optic disc borders anymore. So I pointed out to you earlier, the anatomy, we can see the optic nerve as it comes towards the eyeball on ultrasound, so it's this hypoechoic area, it comes up and it should be nice and flat right here. And we can measure the diameter of this to estimate papal edema or intracranial pressure. The standard way to measure it is 
find the top of it, go back about three millimeters, and then measure the diameter at that point. That's where it's kind of been standardized, I guess you could say. And normally it's around five millimeters. Now there are some difficulties in iterator reliability, but let's talk in principle at least. So here you can see one where, one, you can see if you kind of try to measure, follow the contour of this eyeball, you see it's nice, smooth, and it kind of bulges up. And to me, that's one of the most specific things you can recognize is that if you get this image of it and you see it bulging, no matter what diameter you measure, then it's probably abnormal. And that's a pretty specific finding. But then if you start from the top of this, go down three millimeters and measure this diameter, then it's, it's a dilated optic nerve sheath at uh, six and a half millimeters. So that's what we're looking at. This is the ultrasound equivalent of papilledema and may signify increased intracranial pressure. Just a couple more examples. Here we don't, maybe we see a little bit of this bulging up, then we go back, we measure the diameter, it's almost seven millimeters. Same thing here, we don't have it sliced so we see that bulge necessarily, but we see the diameter is increased. So here we think that we have papilledema or increased pressure for one reason or another. Now why might this be dilated? So it's pretty much always, most of the time it means there's increased intracranial pressure for lots of reasons, right? Hemorrhage, mass, edema, altitude. So I said you can take ultrasound almost anywhere, take it to space, people take it to Everest to look for signs of intracranial pressure elevation. And then idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This is probably, I'm just guessing, this is probably the most common reason I see this in the emergency department is patients with pseudotumor or IIH so that it's usually bo both sides. And then maybe it's dilated because it's inflamed and like optic neuritis is another reason. So you still, no matter what you do, you have to correlate what you see on ultrasound with the whole clinical picture. And this is just, he was going for the eyeball and he really missed it low. Um, but this is, this is just an example of someone using ultrasound at Everest and they use it for lots of reasons to look at pulmonary edema in the lungs, but also for ocular findings of cerebral edema. And then we, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, looking at eye changes in space with ultrasound. This is something that's routinely done on the International Space Station. And I just think it's interesting what they have found and why astronauts who are in space for long periods start to lose vision uh, because you're, um, that, those fluid-filled structures, they lose their shape in a weightless or a low-gravity environment. So their eyeballs kind of flatten out. They're not as round anymore, and their nerves uh, without the, I guess, the constraints of gravity, they kind of fold and they get dilated and lose their structure. So this is thought to be related to why they lose their vision with long International Space Station trips. So if you guys are going to the space station, protect your vision or uh, don't go too long so you don't lose it. All right, so now just a couple of things we can recognize in the retroorbital space. There are not a ton of these, but in some scenarios or in some cases, Patients have either infectious processes or trauma that causes bleeding in the retroorbital space. And we can recognize that with ultrasound as well. So here we can see some blood that's behind the globe itself. You guys see that there? Or sometimes you might see what's been called the guitar pick sign where there's swelling from either infectious process, it could be tumor or blood that's distorting the shape of the eyeball, so maybe it looks a little bit like a guitar pick, I suppose. So those are some of the things you can recognize in the retro bulbar space. It's a pretty short list. So that's really kind of the summary of eyeball. Most important thing I can probably tell you is use the optho or the eye, some eyeball setting if you're going to do ocular ultrasound. When you analyze or try to figure out what's going on with the eyeball, you want to just be systematic, work your way from kind of the front to the back. So anterior chamber, vitreous chamber, nerve, and then retrobulbar space. Don't forget to have your patients do the kinetic exam. So once you've obtained some views and you've got to look, have them look kind of all up, down, left, right, in all directions to look for anything else swirling around in the eyeball. And then don't forget that some of the like vitreous detachments you'll only see with, when you crank the gain up. So part of your exam should include a high gain exam. But all this can, is done in like a minute. It's very quick, right? Tiny structure, pretty easy.